Oh, if Gabe and Carrie, if you could join us, um, I will open up. We'll open up for some questions. We have 25 minutes, so that's a lot of time. And I'll let them all get organized, and then we'll take the first question. Just so. Yes. Yes, please. Wait, wait, to the microphone, so. Given that the star of most BDS conferences abroad is a member of Israeli academia, why is it that nobody in this country wants to do anything about those people? I just would like to point out to Professor Golan that the people who criticized Ben-Gurion University's syllabus in social sciences was a commi international committee of non-Jews. was an international committee of non-Jewish academics who found not only that the syllabus was uh, completely uh, uh, flawed, but they also found out that the, but the whole process of recruitment and promotion had been corrupted and nobody who wasn't a post-Zionist or anti-Zionist had a chance of getting in. And I speak as a governor of the university. Uh, you? My only response is that uh, let's talk about Tel Aviv University. Um, where the leader of the uh, PACB movement is Omar Barghouti, who's getting his doctorate at this institution. And 184,000 people signed a petition that he should be removed from the list of students. And the president of this university said no in the name of academic freedom. Was he right or was he wrong? About that, we can have an interesting debate. And maybe it's to our credit, in fact, that he did not do so. What happened at Ben Gurion University, and I speak as a previous dean, and therefore, I am inhibited from saying more than I've just said. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know if we need to go into the whole details of Ben Gurion University, as you probably know. I was on the uh, Malag committee that was evaluating the political science departments around the country. And so I had firsthand um, um, experience of what was an effort to close down the department and or dictate what it could teach or not teach. And because um, there were things that were problematic in the department, there were things that were problematic in a lot of departments uh, in the country. But I think, uh, as I said, I don't want to go into all the details now, but there definitely was an effort to that went, a, went in a political direction where the minister who normally would not intervene in such things, actually did intervene, and there clearly was a, a politicization of the process. I the students, and you have to know that because I was there. Yeah. So you have to be careful about your criticism because they dictated the students. They, they, they intimidate the students. They intimidate the students. Of course. And I don't who, who, who intimidated students? I, I was, I was sitting there in the meeting. I can assure you, they were, they weren't intimidated. So, so, if I can add a personal note, I was on the other side of it because when I started, when I left the IDF and was going to teach in Tel Aviv University, there was an attempt by some professors not to let me teach there because I'm a war criminal. Um, and uh, of course, the Tel Aviv University was not was opposed to this uh, attempt and. Uh, taught, I still teach in Tel Aviv University, but my personal uh, uh, opinion is that um, as they shouldn't have stopped me from teaching, well, I, I don't think I'm a war criminal anyway, um, but I think it is important to, uh, I, think, I think one of the great things of Israeli academia is that you can have all, those, all voices there and that you can have also those that are very critical on Israeli policy inside the academia. Um, I, I think that's actually something which is a good thing uh, and part of our democratic values. Yeah, let but, me just say um, that teaching Israel both here and in America, the debate in an Israeli classroom is far more vigorous far more, because it's far more informed than it is abroad. And um, I think that we can actually be proud of the Israeli Academy for having uh, people of many different stripes 
sitting in the same classroom, uh, debating with one another. That debate occurs not only in the classroom, but as we all know, outside the classroom. In the United States, what we're worried about is that that might change. Um, I have nothing to say about Ben-Gurion University, though I am familiar with the struggles there, but not enough to comment on it. But I can say that I have watched in the United States some disciplines begin to create uh, highly politicized departments that really cohere around a single political point of view. And there are you know, actually many fields that do that. I mean, uh, how many economics departments in the United States have a Marxist economist available on the staff? You wouldn't, you wouldn't find too many. Um, it is, I mean, it is a, a kind of natural outgrowth of academic freedom sometimes for a department to cohere around a particular point of view. Um, what's important is that efforts to impose those views on students don't take place. But you have to, you have to stop short in, in dealing with the problem of basically undermining the academic freedom of the departments involved. What can help? Well, years ago, just to give you a non-political example, Harvard University withdrew the English department's right to hire new faculty because they said Harvard University's English department was consistently hiring mediocre public colleagues so that they, the colleagues already there, would look good and offer, and the new people would offer no challenge. Um, not, not a political issue. And for quite some years, uh, Harvard's, Harvard appointed a group of outside faculty to do the English department's hiring until the department could be restored um, <laughs> to include younger people of first caliber rather than second or third caliber. Part of, what's, part of what is needed is a review process at the college level, the campus level, that insists on quality. That is, that reviews appointments to make certain that whatever their political point of view, they represent the highest academic standards. When a department sort of starts to hire people who simply conform to their political views but don't represent the highest academic standards, then I think you have a crisis. Um, I do believe that that happened recently at my own campus, the University of Illinois, um, and actually there was some intervention above to stop it. We'll see what the final story is on that. But that's one thing that needs to take place, that the department really leaves quality behind and instead looks simply for political conformity then it's time for the review processes above to really intervene and stop those appointments or do what's necessary. Sometimes d departments that do that need to be put in receivership and, and those uh, responsibilities taken away from them. But ideological conformity is a feature of academic life in many different disciplines and um, it's, it's not so easy to overcome. I think it's, um, it's very clear that Israeli academia is involved in the BDS um, movement. And I think Ilan Pape, for example, uh, in the overview of Professor Ziegler, he was not mentioned as part of the Mona uh, Baker and the Stephen Rose effort. So I think um, a lot of uh, Israeli academics are uh, doing a lot of delegitimization of Israel, and that's being served to blame Israel for, uh, for apartheid and Nazi-like uh, behavior. And I think um, it's not on, it, quite a, a large number of Israeli academics, actually. It's not just one or two. I mean, it's, uh, we're talking about um, quite a large group of people, including, for example, Dalit Baum, who's actually sitting here, and she was hired by the Presbyterian Church to do BDS uh, in America, and she's left uh, Haifa University especially for this. And so, I mean, I think she, she could have actually served here and actually explained part of the BDS effort um, and not just uh, sort of be in the audience. So, uh, okay, do you want to respond? Yeah, I just want to say that, um, of course, Ilan Papi exists, but so does uh, Yoav <laughs> Gelber. And so the real question is not whether they exist within the Israeli Academy, but the question is why did the Presbyterian Church choose to privilege the perspective of Elon Pape as opposed to Yoav Gelber. 
And so that it's not enough to point out that there are this voice and that voice in the Israeli economy. The real question for those who live abroad is why is one particular voice becoming the, the conformist position in different institutions? So we have to look there rather than here for what's taking place. Professor Baum, do you want to? He was right. Because he went up and I spoke on this subject. He's a liar. So the question is how the You know, I really don't think that that's the topic. Um, I think there's no question There's no question that what we want to see in the universities, and I can say that as having been head of the department at the Hebrew University and had a number of positions of hiring and not firing, but promoting or not promoting, and the whole point is indeed quality. It is indeed quality, and not, not a question of whether we like their political views or we don't like their political views. And the same is true if it's an MA thesis or a PhD thesis. The, the point is, is it a scholarly piece of work? Is it based on evidence? Is it not based on evidence? And that's up for the university and the judges of the, of the material to determine. The, I think the problem, whether it's coming from the left or from the right, the issue has to be, has to be freedom of expression. <coughs> It has to be freedom, academic freedom, and yes, indeed, it does have to be a question of quality first. Yes, but you have to put out the lions. But, um, you, want to, you would uh, like us to curb the lions and not let the lions go late. abroad? Is that the idea? Traitors, traitors, no Okay. So since you were mentioned, else. That's so not quality. That's Professor not Obama. Quality work. That's not intellectual honesty. It shouldn't be accepted. Thank you. Um, I want to say that I've taught both in Israeli academia and a little bit in the U.S. academia. And my experience was very, very different from what I've heard here today. Uh, first of all, Israel studies or anything to do with Israel is highly politicized here in Israel and also in the U.S. Uh, anyone teaching Israel studies abroad knows that most views are definitely politicized and very, very strictly monitored. Uh, especially in, the, in, in Israel as well. In Israel as well, not as much as in the U.S. Let me lie for a moment. What do you care? And then you can respond. The power, the power relations are very, very different. אוקיי, בואו נשמע רק ואחר כך אפשר להגיד. תודה לך. תודה. The power relations are very, very different. What happens today in the U.S. and some of the quotes you brought are not quotes that I agree with, but there are people who lost their jobs. Myself, I taught a class about nonviolence in UC Santa Cruz once. It was not especially critical of Israel. It just had a variety of views in it. a very, very wide variety of views, such a class that would be accepted anywhere, especially in Israel. And the kind of attack that I received from scholars for peace in the Middle East, the so-called group represented by one of the people here, was just despicable. It was all about silencing, going after the person, not the message. It was, and all of these complaints, and they have filed hundreds of complaints, not just about me, but on anyone who voiced any kind of critique, All of these complaints were always dismissed on the merits. It was not grounded. So what we are seeing is a coordinated attack on any kind of criticism of Israel, especially in the U.S., and now it's creeping into Israel. Now it creeps into the Israeli academia. Now you're asking yourself, why is there more criticism of Israel in the world? Because of Israeli policies. Read the news. Ser seriously. Seriously. And still, and still, The dominant views and the dominant hegemonic uh, uh, structures in the U.S. are totally pro-Israeli. When it comes to the vote in the Senate, you get 100 votes pro-Israel. You get the tremendous support of the U.S. You get the vetoing power. So, seriously? A Kozaka Nigzal. People are sitting here and feel like they are in some... Jewish students on campus have to face this growing criticism. It's unpleasant. Young people have to hear that they live in a complex world. They live in a place where there is criticism 
okay. over some things that uh, they thought from us, kindergarten uh, that uh, one, there is no problem. Uh, one, one second, please. Let, let Professor is, Baum finish what she wants is, to say shortly, and uh, we will move this, to the next uh, question. This so. is part of education and freedom of speech. This is what students are supposed to be, to feel and hear and encounter in campus. Okay, thank you. And now to the next. Uh, I mean, uh, and just one, one, one little second. I came here because I was really curious. I really wanted to know more about what people feel and think. And I, you know, I really wanted to hear more. And I want to say something to you all guys. If you think that the academic boycott is such a big problem, one of the things you should do is bring people here that actually know more about the academic boycott and listen to what they have to say. You discuss the uh, association, the American Studies Association of, uh, resolution about uh, academic uh, boycotts. Bring the resolution here and read it. What does it actually say? Start with the facts. It says that they want to boycott academic institutions in Israel because they are specifically, one by one, complicit in the Israeli occupation. Okay. Now, you may not agree with that, but okay. you have to okay. deal with that. Thank you, you have to deal with the facts. Okay. Um, quiet in the room. I feel like in the Knesset. Yes, yeah. please. And uh, wait, uh, but I think Carrie wanted to respond and Gabe too, so. First, uh, um, about, about 10 years ago, I began writing about the climate on American campuses for discussions of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And part of what I said at the time was that campuses are complex places with multiple spaces and that there are places on a given campus where uh, pro-Arab students and faculty will feel that their voices are suppressed. And there are places on American campuses where pro-Israeli students and faculty will feel that they are utterly silenced. Campuses have different configurations, different disciplines dominate some spaces, different organizations end up controlling some spaces. To some degree, that remains true, that, one, that both positions will feel silenced in certain different settings. That said, the frequent BDS claim that pro-Palestinian voices are suppressed and silenced for many American campuses is an utter nonsense. On my, on my campus, which is the flagship state, univer state university campus of the University of Illinois, it is impossible to schedule a, a, an anti-BDS talk. All that happens are pro-BDS events. The only place you could do a pro an anti-BDS talk is the Hillel Center, and that's because the Hillel Center actually has established legal guidelines where it can prohibit certain uh, particularly loud and destructive people from entering the building so you can have a conversation without people yelling at you. But, you know, I think you will find campuses across the United States where the humanities disciplines that are very intensely uh, anti-Israeli have managed to dominate the spaces of public conversation and suppress those voices. So, you know, BDS partly operates by making this pervasive claim that it is silenced and suppressed, even though on some campuses it is clearly the other side that's silenced and suppressed. Um, honesty about it, about the situation on given campuses, would go a long way toward dealing with the situation. I mean, rather than simply claiming a political uh, force that often just doesn't okay. exist. Uh, and Gabe wanted to add something. I won't respond to everything uh, Talit uh, said, <laughs> but um, I have my degree from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I taught there myself. It's one of the um, worst, most anti-Israel campuses in the nation. It's one of the most politically correct, ideologically homogeneous, far-left campuses in the world. I don't know what uh, are the details of the criticism you received while teaching there, but your position is represented there all the time. It's a campus that is uh, hostile to the state of Israel, to Zionism, and very friendly to your views. And if you spent time there, I'm sure you know that. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, I want to ask about the uh, hostility that uh, was just mentioned to Israel, the intimidation on campus that goes beyond uh, the what is permissible beyond uh, the misuse of the freedom of speech, for instance, to the prevention of speech when it comes to pro-Israeli 
position. Um, as a way of introduction, come to the question. I have been uh, fairly influential the last couple of years in creating a number of uh, NGOs in various countries, UK lawyers for Israel, South African lawyers for Israel, and meeting this week about the creation of Australian lawyers for Israel and working on Dutch lawyers for Israel. A lot of what these people do is counter anti-Israeli activity on and off the campus, but particularly on the campus. And the UK lawyers for Israel have been highly successful you don't hear about their actions so much. Highly successful in offsetting anti-Israel activities on campuses, including uh, boycotts and other actions. My question really to the panel is, do they think, especially in America, that actually the, using the application of law to offset actions on campus which are anti-Israel to the extent that they go beyond the permitted freedom of speech to anti-democratic methods. Yes. Uh, who wants to... Da David, do you want to say something? Well, I mean, it's hard to address that as a generality. I mean, it's hard, if you invoke actions that go beyond the limits of the law for the, that are that really are impermissible, it's hard to deal with that except with specific examples. But I will say that as a general rule, I think there is much greater risk in the application of law to handle speech that than uh, in simply the employment of alternative speech and better speech. I mean, I think the the counter the, the counter to irrational speech, destructive speech, dishonest speech is better quality speech. And I think the application of law is very dangerous for many reasons. First of all, if you look back at the course of American history you will find that both the left and the right, when they've been dominant at various times, have made efforts to, su to suppress speech, not only on, ca on campus, but in the culture as a whole. Everything like this comes around. Either you, either you let speech go where it's going to go on a campus, or I think you will end up creating a climate that may end up punishing you, even if you have a dominant position at a given moment in time. You know. Okay. Um. Let, let me just add that uh, I, I think using going to court for every offensive statement is not what one ought to do. Uh, but one has to work towards creating a climate in which there is free discussion. And BDS, by definition, is against freedom of expression. It is, after all, about boycotting, about not permitting people to come. That's what's wrong with it. Yes, the gentleman over. Maybe we'll take two questions. So the gentleman over there, and then the gentleman over here. And then. Hello. It's working. OK, um, I, I'd just like to try and connect two things here. Uh, one is what really was most clear in uh, Gabriel Brown's speech, uh, which is the, the irrational character of the hostility towards Israel that's expressed in much of the BDS speech and really a driving force in it. And that's something I think that the critics of Israel who believe that if there were enough pressure on Israel to stop the occupation that would somehow lessen the strength of BDS need to meditate on. Because I think that we're dealing with a situation um, in which deeply irrational forces are at work and the idea that you can actually influence them by, for example, uh, better behavior on your part actually, I think, falls into the kind of uh, attitude that we see in Judith Butler, which is if we're just sufficiently suppliant, then somehow they won't be so aggressive to us. And I think that we have to understand that this aggression represents a level of um, moral disorientation on, on a civilizational scale. And that uh, that's what we have to address and not can we behave better and somehow by behaving better um, gain somehow sympathy or, or lessen aggression. And I, I'd like to address that, uh, Carrie, specifically to you because you actually seem to imply that this could have some influence on BDS, which I don't. And then, uh, Professor Golan, I'd like to ask you, uh, there was a fairly famous case recently 
in which um, there was a fairly famous case recently in which a, a dissertation at Hebrew University received an award from a committee for showing that the reason that the IDF soldiers don't rape is because they're racist. Would you say that's a good example of the judgment I don't know anything of about academics? It, so I can't answer. <laughs> Excuse me? Um, <laughs> wait, uh, Dalia, one second. We'll take another, another question. A short one, please. Hello? Who? Yes. Great. Um, uh, I'll kind of compensate for the time by just speaking really fast. That normally works. Um, <laughs> uh, so, look, um, I think we... We'll add, we'll, add, we add, we'll add a few more minutes. We add, we'll add some more minutes, and Amos Maximum will speak a little bit. Okay. Um, one, this meeting is tended to address, particularly this discussion, um, the academic boycott in the framework of academia. Um, there's, of course, another paradigm, which is kind of where I've come from, which is addressing it in the context of the broader anti-Israel boycott movement. Um, you know, and so we've associated academic boycott with discussions on campus and this and that rather than looking at academic boycott as a part of the broader anti-Israel boycott movement. In that broader movement, it's probably one of the least popular boycotts. Um, it, 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 that and cultural boycott, people object to them. Um, they don't feel right. They poll really badly. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the broader anti-Israel boycott movement isn't focusing on it, because it's just not very popular. Um, it doesn't win them very, very much, um, interestingly. Um, when we treat it as a broader part of the border boycott movement, then the tools depend on the forum. If you're trade unions, it's a political problem. You deal with it politically. If you're winning arguments in a meeting, then you make the right speeches. If you, you know, it's a, the game will depend on the tools. Um, a couple of points that David made, um, that we have to do something phenomenal. Um, and I sat through trade union me movement meetings that have voted through academic boycotts because we have, to, we have to do something for the Palestinians. Not because the people support boycott, but that was the only motion they had. And either you vote yes or no, those are the options. And if you vote no, then you hate the Palestinians. So obviously you vote yes. So uh, the, the challenge for us, and maybe this, this is certainly a question, is what positive things can we give those people who support Palestinians and Palestinian rights to do which aren't attacking the state of Israel? How, how can we help them divert their energies positively? Okay. Uh, 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 let's... Why, we, we, okay. we want to leave some more time. So, um, so there were two questions here, I think, main ones. One was the occupation. Does it really make a difference? And the second is also uh, the, the point that was raised now. So, let's so to address Richard Landis' question, Richard has a great essay in our book, by the way. And, uh, um, uh, start with that observation. Um, look, there are leaders of the BDS movement who will only be satisfied by the dissolution of the Jewish state. They make that clear in their writings. They say it all the time when they talk. And there's nothing, there's nothing Israel can do to affect them one way or another short of mass suicide. Uh, and I don't recommend that. So they're just hopeless. But the left in the US, as a broad movement, requires something from this kind of dynamic. And that is victims. They have to have a group of people who they see as daily oppressed and victimized. And if you're out of the West Bank, they ain't got that anymore. In other words, if all of the Palestinians, if the, the Palestinians on the West Bank are no longer under daily Israeli supervision, then the left has lost part of its psychological dynamic. And, 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 and the, let's, let's, Professor. Um, I think that, you know, that has to be part of a general settlement. It has to gradually improve conditions. A lot of things have to happen, but I think a settlement would leave the left without its victims by and large, and the BDS movement largely collapses at that point, save its semi-psychotic or delusional leaders um, who aren't going to go anywhere, but they're not going to matter after that. I mean. You know, you can, you can say that you don't believe I'm right, and yep, that's fine. Um, I, I'm confident you would say that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have some conviction that the movement can be defanged by the right political changes in the Middle East. Um, what, what about the question about... about I think I think the point, if I can, if I can, is that is that 
the, the, the center of the BDS, it won't make any difference. But the, but, but the, the attention, uh, the acceptance that it's getting within the wider public, which is, I think, the main problem, there it will be relevant. And that's, I think, the place where we have to work more because that's, 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 that's the threat. The BDS, just as a small group, is less threatening than when it uh, has such a support or growing support by the liberal uh, center and left uh, of the society in Europe and in the US academia. Um, so two last comments and, uh, or questions. Short, please. And uh, good evening. I would like to ask the moderator the call now. Um, we are here at the Tel Aviv University, um, which receives funding for, from the Ministry of Defense. In this institute, for warmongers who actually drafted the Dahia Doctrine, the criminal Dahia Doctrine, on the lands of the Palestinian village of Shechmunes. Uh, there are many other activities that the, Tel Aviv that the Tel Aviv University, many other activities that the Tel Aviv University is complicit in, uh, which are in support of Israeli occupation and apartheid. Why shouldn't decent people around the world boycott this complicit Tel Aviv University? Okay, I'll answer. And with the last comment there. Oh. You could always start, I mean. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a short question. Uh, what, would be a, what would you consider a legitimate non-violent opposition to the occupation? Uh, Professor Nelson, Professor Trump. I think, um, of course, I don't accept most of your uh, uh, sub uh, assumptions. Um, I think um, that uh, we are living in a very complicated uh, place with uh, uh, um, two peoples that both have good claims. I, I don't think that the Palestinians don't have a, on, have an, on suffering or that there aren't really problems with what's happening here. But I think that because it's so complex, it's very simplistic to put all the blame on one side. And I think that a lot of the blame is also on the other side. And under this complex situation where you have, where you have a conflict that there have been many attempts to solve, they haven't succeeded many times, not because of the Israeli side necessarily, also by, uh, by the Palestinian side, both sides are to blame, let's take it. Um, in this context, I think you have to do the best you can. Unless, of course, you accept Judith Butler's uh, uh, suggestion. We can all pack our things and go back to wherever we came from. But if we're not going to do that, we have to acknowledge that by being there here, first of all, we have certain people that feel that they have been unjustly uprooted from their house from Sheikh Munis. Yes. Okay, but it, does that mean that we have to now leave the whole country and get them back? I'm not so sure, especially since we also don't have where to go, and especially since we also have our rights and our claims. So now, one second. So now, in this complex situation, in this complex situation, we have to do our best. And our best is to comply by the rules, in my view. And I think our best from the other side is to try and understand international law and Israeli law and it is very easy to say that everything is illegal or that everything is corrupt and everything is bad, but I think that's both simplistic, both doesn't really, isn't really uh, the truth of it, and I think that doesn't contribute in any way to promoting peace, it just makes the extremists stronger on both sides. Um, I, think, I think this was a very interesting uh, debate, and I will just let uh, the panelists, if they want to say some last sentence, or they are... Have, that, have said what they... So... One sentence. One. It was very interesting to hear all of you. It was very interesting to hear all of you, and I, I hope that you, you understood that you can uh, drop the concern about uh, the uni uh, universities in the United States and deal with the, with the problem in the Israeli uh, universities. I think the Israeli universities are great. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for the panel, to the panel, and almost you have seven minutes. <laughs>